Welcome to this webinar on integrated simulation using Autodesk Nastran NCAD, available as part of the Product Design and Manufacturing Collection. My name is James Herzing, a Product Marketing Manager here at Autodesk, and I have been a dedicated simulation specialist for the past 13 years. I've heard a number of reasons why people choose not to use simulation over the years. Oftentimes, the conversation comes back to, this is the way we've always done things and it's worked so far, or that changing the design based on simulation results will complicate the manufacturing process that much more. Others feel that simulation takes too much time to fit into their already tight timelines, or think that since their products currently work as is, there's no reason to go back and simulate. I'm here to tell you, none of these are good reasons. Just think about some of the questions that simulation can answer for you. Relatively simple questions like, will my part fail? Or how strong does it need to be? Or more complex questions like, how do all of these parts interact? It can even help with questions that affect the bottom line, like can I produce parts faster? And can I reduce defect rates? Without simulation, these questions aren't easy to answer. You're working with complex assemblies that can greatly range in loading conditions. You might have to be concerned with how your parts react under different temperature profiles, determine if fatigue is an issue, or figure out if the material is right for your needs. Wouldn't it just be easier to pick something stronger and call it a day? You've done it for similar products, why not here? This is a perfect example of how not simulating can hurt. Choosing a stronger material or designing your parts just a bit thicker to avoid failure can increase material costs while decreasing product performance. The ideal design lies somewhere in the middle, an intersection that simulation can help you determine. Not convinced? Think about some of the additional costs you incur just to avoid simulation. Choosing a material that is too strong could result in more costly materials, and choosing one that isn't strong enough is going to increase part thickness. Simulation can help you choose the best material for your needs quickly, with the added savings of reducing the need for physical prototypes. If you still choose to bypass simulation, the excess weight of these parts will not only make your design less efficient, but could also reduce the number of cycles to failure, thus increasing warranty claims. So you're ready to admit that there might be something to simulating? Now, when should you start? Studies have shown that simulating early and often during the design process provides the best opportunity to affect the functional capabilities of a design while sustaining the lowest cost of change possible. Sure, simulation can and should be done during the testing and even into the early manufacturing stages, but the cost of change will rise significantly if modifications are found to be necessary, and it will be nearly impossible to add functionality to the design at this point. Here's a short list of ways that simulation can help you in the design process, all of which we'll take a look at in Nastran NCAD in just a few moments. In addition to these, I'll show you how to optimize for stress, temperature, and impact loading. Before we even get into setting up our first analysis, it is important to keep in mind that the more complex your assembly is, the longer it will take to analyze. If it is possible to simplify your design while keeping it accurate for analysis, it's a good idea to do so. This means removing features like raised text, chamfers and fillets that don't really matter, or, like in the case of this linear stress analysis, suppressing parts that are not of interest for the analysis. With everything but the hub suppressed, we're ready to move to the Nastran NCAD environment. Let's take a second to review the ribbon at the top of the screen. No matter what analysis you are performing, you will work in the same left to right fashion. With the analysis type already set to linear stress, we'll now define materials. Fortunately, in this example, we already have the materials defined from the CAD model, but if that wasn't the case, you could enter the material screen and choose from any of the existing materials or define your own. With our material selected, we can now define the loads and boundary conditions, or in other words, tell the program how the part is used in the real world. We'll start by adding boundary conditions, or the things that define how your part is going to move. These could represent the part being welded to another part of the assembly, being pressed up against a wall, or in this case, being fixed in place because of the bolts going through the 12 bolt holes. For the load, let's take a look at the force on the innermost diameter from the axle. To make it a little more realistic, instead of just applying a plain force or a pressure, we can choose to apply a bearing load, which emulates the force of a cylinder on the surface. With that, we're now ready for our first analysis. When looking at the results of a linear stress analysis, there will typically be two types of results that you will pay attention to, displacement and stress. 
We can see from the resulting stress that the bearing load is just under 19,000 psi, well under yield for this part. If this was above the yield stress of the material, this would tell you that you either need to design some sort of reinforcement, modify the material, or reduce the load seen by this part. Looking at the displacement values, we can ensure that the part will not interfere with anything else in the assembly upon loading. This will also give us another way to check to ensure that the results are accurate, since the stress results are based off of the displacement values. So, if you have unrealistic displacement values, you'll know that your stress results are probably too high. Let's use the same model to investigate thermal loading. If we change parts, we're now going to be able to simulate temperature values resulting from the breaks. Why is this important? One reason is the addition of the thermal stress to the model could put a material past yield. Another is that the warpage occurring due to the thermal expansion could cause parts to grind against each other, causing unexpected failure. Notice that we didn't have to do anything other than activate the part we were interested in and suppress the other one to run this analysis. No importing new geometry, no launching another program. Since we're looking for thermal results this time, we'll have to start by defining our analysis type to be steady state heat transfer. Just like with a linear stress analysis, this is like a snapshot in time of how the loads are affecting your part. Also like the stress analysis, all we have to do is define material, loads, and boundary conditions before analyzing. This time, we already have the material properties defined from the inventor model, so we'll jump to the loads. You'll notice that the loads from the analysis are a little different. Instead of forces and pressures, we'll be applying convection loads and heat flux values. The convection load will be applied to all of the surfaces except for the ones that the brake pads are applied to. This will represent the temperature of the air surrounding our part, which we will assume to be room temperature. This value could vary based on your product. Electronics, for example, often have higher temperature values inside of enclosures that need to be accounted for. It is important to keep in mind that for your thermal analysis, you'll need to have at least two loads so that the program knows how the temperature profile will change. Think of it like a wire with electricity. The power starts at one point and moves through the wire to another. We're now ready to analyze the part. For those of you who think simulation is difficult, remember we basically pressed two buttons to set up this entire analysis. Loads and run. Pretty simple, right? Interpreting thermal results is just as easy. The temperature profile is what you usually focus on here. As expected, the highest temperatures result where the brakes are applied and drop as we move inward. This is a relatively simple example as it's just one part, but think how this could help you with a larger assembly. For user safety, you will understand if the outside temperature will be too hot to be safe. For an electronics example, you can see if the power output from one of the parts cause another, more delicate part to overheat or potentially cause the epoxy holding it to fail. And from a mechanical point of view, you can determine if the resulting temperature profile will cause stress problems or part interference. This is exactly what we're going to look at next. To run a thermal stress analysis, all we have to do is change the existing analysis type from thermal to linear stress. Just like before, we apply boundary conditions to define how the part will move. In addition to these boundary conditions, let's apply a twisting load to the part. I'm not going to get into the reasons why we have to apply rigid elements like we are here, but I would like to point out that these simple line parts analyze much more quickly than the solid parts that you typically work with from CAD. This is a great way to simplify your design for analysis, where you can replace something like a bolt with a line element, eliminating contact between parts and greatly reducing your runtime. After applying the moment, all that is left is to apply the temperature profile from the part. Since the results of the previous analysis are saved in a file, all you have to do is browse to that file and NAS Training CAD does the rest. Assuming the material you defined has a thermal coefficient of expansion included, you'll be all set. Let's take this chance to show you another powerful feature of NAS Training CAD that'll save you a ton of time down the road. That is, setting up subcases. Your designs probably are loaded in a number of ways, from forces, to pressures, to combining thermal and torque loads like we did here. To avoid setting up each analysis separately, all you have to do is create a new subcase for each loading condition, and when you press run, each case will be analyzed for you to investigate. I'll set up one subcase looking at the torque load only, and another including torque and temperature. Since we've already looked at the results options for both of these analysis types, I'm going to skip over them for this setup and move to the next example. The one feature that I will point out though is that in the middle of the ribbon there is now a dropdown. 
From here, you can choose which subcase you are interested in examining further. For our next example, I'm going to change over to something we're all familiar with, a smartphone. And I bet we've all had that moment where we accidentally drop it and hope that the screen doesn't crack. Do you think the phone companies just repeatedly drop phones to see if their designs work? Well, they probably do some of that, but not nearly as much thanks to impact analysis and drop testing with simulation. Now, I know that drop tests are notoriously thought of as the most complex analysis type in FEA, but I'm going to show you that they really aren't so different from any other analysis. Do they take longer to analyze? Sure, but the setup and skill necessary to run them are no different. We still work left to right on the same ribbon and define the same things like material. Let's take a moment to look at the material options in a little more detail. Since most of us protect our phones with a rubbery case, we would need to set up a special material to represent this. Looking at the type dropdown, you'll see a number of options, including hyperelastic. This is one of my favorite nonlinear material models, and this is what you would use to represent that rubbery case. Parts using the hyperelastic material model will have much more intricate stress strain curves as they tend to vary more greatly under loading conditions. For the drop test, we'll skip adding traditional loads and boundary conditions and use the impact analysis subcase options instead. All you have to do is pick the part that's dropping, the line it's going to follow, and the acceleration of the fall, better known as gravity in this case. Before we analyze, we have to define contact between the phone and the floor. I know, everyone gets scared off when we talk about contact, but it's as simple as picking the bottom surface of the phone and the top surface of the floor. The results are no different than that of the linear stress analysis, other than each time step during the impact process is captured and able to be looked at individually. This is because, instead of a snapshot in time like linear stress, the impact analysis is time dependent, so your results will vary over time. Looking at this, we'll see the bottom of the phone that hits the floor is where you see the highest stress value, and that it is below yield. That being said, if we reran this analysis and looked at it impacting on the corner, we might be able to see that the phone would crack. Just think how much time and development and additional cost and physical prototyping would be necessary if companies weren't running these tests early in the design process. The last example I want to quickly look at today is for all the machine design folks out there, or really anyone that has to be concerned with vibration. The first step for investigating vibration is determining the natural frequencies of your product. Model setup for this analysis type is just like a linear stress analysis, but the results typically depend more on the mass of the different assembly components instead of the loads applied. When you run a modal analysis, you're looking for the natural frequencies that are close to those that would be occurring on your part from something like a motor running. If these values match too closely, you'll know that you have to add mass or stiffen your components. Something to keep in mind when looking at the results is that you're really only concerned about the frequency values in the shapes of the modes, not the displacement. These values are just used by the program to determine the frequencies, but we'll save that conversation for another day. After finishing the modal analysis, you can take the results and run further tests to determine resulting stress on your part. Some examples would be a frequency response analysis for a part like this, or a response spectrum analysis for structures like buildings being tested under earthquake loading conditions. Although natural frequencies are often an afterthought in design, not much will tear apart a machine faster than matching frequencies. I know after all this, you must be excited to get started with Autodesk Nastran NCAD, but how do you get your hands on it? It's all part of the Autodesk product design and manufacturing collection. This collection gives you everything you need to design and make products from start to finish. With this, you have access to AutoCAD for drawing layouts, Inventor for 3D CAD design, HSM for creating machine toolpaths, 3ds Max for rendering and animating your designs, ReCAT Pro for capturing point cloud data, Vault to manage all of your data in a secure environment, and much, much more. So that's everything that I have for you today. Thank you once again for joining me for this webinar. If you have any questions about Nastran NCAD, another product in the product design and manufacturing collection, or would like some help finding a local representative, please feel free to email me directly at james.herzing at autodesk.com. Have a great day.